Hello, my name is Richard Suskind. I'm the chair of the Lord Chief Justice's AI Advisory Group, and the purpose of this module is to introduce to you the whole idea of using artificial intelligence in the law. It's quite a personal field for me, the field of AI and law. I've really spent the large part of my career in this field, thinking about how it is that computers might enhance the support to the work of lawyers and of judges. By way of expectation management, I should say that I think a lot of what's said about AI, both in the law and more generally, hugely overstates the short-term impact of this technology. However, and this is probably more important, I think much of the commentary actually understates the long-term impact. Will AI radically change the work of lawyers and the courts within the next couple of years? Not at all. By 2030, will we see substantial change? Very much so. So this defines the challenge for many of us, the 2020s, the era in which I believe artificial intelligence will have great impact on the practice of law and the administration of justice. But back to basics, what do I actually mean by AI? And all of us in the world of AI define AI in different ways. I find it quite helpful to think of a distinction between architectural and functional definitions of AI. An architectural definition will speak about the enabling technologies. You may hear people talking about logic programming or neural networks, people who are interested in the underlying technicalities. I'm more interested in functional definitions of AI. That's to say what these systems actually do, what impact they'll have, what tasks they'll take on. And in the broadest of terms, it seems to me when we speak of AI and the law, we're talking about systems that can perform tasks and solve problems and address issues that historically at least we thought required human intelligence. More than that, I think under the heading of AI, we're also talking about systems that in a way can perform at a superhuman level. We're seeing systems, not just in law, we're seeing it in medicine, in tax, in audit, and in other fields too systems that actually are very highly performing in the limited areas can undertake tasks at a remarkably high level. So in the broadest of terms then, I'm looking at and thinking about, and I've spent my life researching into the idea of systems that can undertake tasks in the past we thought could only be undertaken by human lawyers. I use a different term actually than artificial intelligence. I talk about increasingly capable machines because I think that's the phenomenon we all need to think about. Hardly a day passes when we don't hear some headline or read an article about a new robot, a system, a technology, an app, a breakthrough where systems are doing more and more. And of course, one of the key enabling technologies is artificial intelligence. But the broader point is our machines are becoming increasingly capable. They are able to do more and more and naturally we should ask how can this support, enhance, and to what extent it is a threat to our conventional work. One way of looking at the world of AI and law, I think, is to understand it's really come in two waves, this field. And I was very much involved in the first wave of AI. I undertook my doctorate in Oxford in the 80s, developing what was known as an expert system there. The idea of this was very straightforward, and this is how we thought about AI in the 80s, that what you did to create a system that could perform at a high level was you sat down with a human expert, you mined the jewels from their head, and you essentially represented their knowledge or their expertise as a kind of decision tree, a huge flowchart. And the purpose of these systems was to allow less expert people to roam through this flowchart or decision tree to solve problems at the level of experts without having to directly consult the experts themselves. So the process of building an expert system or an AI system was that of interpreting and representing an expert human being's knowledge and expertise in a particular area and making that available as some kind of decision tree. My PhD looked into expert systems, their potential, their limitations for law and lawyers, and I was approached by a man called Philip Capper, who at the time was the chair of the law school at Oxford, and he told me about a new piece of legislation called the Latent Damage Act 1986, which fundamentally changed the law of limitation. And he said this new act was impenetrable, a complex web of interrelated, convoluted rules that the profession was really struggling to handle. So he said to me, why don't we use the techniques you developed in your PhD to develop a fully working system that can answer the question that everyone's asking in this field, which is, when can an action no longer be raised because it's time barred? And so we set about developing that system. I sat down with him as the leading expert, I mined the jewel from his head, and essentially represented his knowledge and expertise as a huge decision tree. 
There were over two million paths through this decision tree, all possible permutations and variations in this really difficult area of law, capturing not just the legislation, but a whole body of relevant case law, as well as good practice too. And in the end, that system could actually solve problems that used to take maybe a couple of hours for people who are new to the field, could solve them in a few minutes. Philip to this day, and he was the leading expert, will say the system was better than him. It outperformed him. It never had a hangover. It never had a Friday afternoon syndrome. It was relentlessly rigorous and could solve problems in this complex area of law. And that was over 30 years ago. But that was the first system showing at least that it was technically possible to take a complex area of law and essentially provide a system that can guide less expert people through the legal complexities and difficulties. What's quite interesting, if you fast forward 30 years or so, the same technology, rule-based expert systems, is still being used within law firms, for example, in the automation of documents as the field of document assembly, where systems can generate fairly polished first drafts on the basis of a set of questions answered by users. That's the same underpinning technology. Similarly, in the world of international tax, the large tax compliance systems process very complex webs of interrelated rules, again using a similar set of technologies. But actually, there were several things we didn't anticipate when we were working in the 80s using rule-based expert systems. The first was the World Wide Web. It was invented in the early 90s, and most of us working in legal AI were just swept away by the web. It's hard to describe in retrospect, but it was so exciting. Suddenly, there was a possibility of making content, advice, materials, documents available online at no cost, interrelated to one another. So one of the reasons I think the first wave of AI and law, as some people have said, failed, I think that's overstated, but one of the reasons they weren't fully exploited was that most people working in AI and law, certainly in the commercial sector, moved away from AI and started experimenting with web. Another thing we didn't anticipate was what is often referred to as the exponential and explosive growth in the processing power of machines. And this came home to us very much in 97, where a computer system called Deep Blue beat the world chess champion, Garry Kasparov. Most of us thought that system would never be able to beat a grandmaster chess player. We hadn't anticipated this explosive growth in processing power. At the time Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov, this was a system that could explore more than 330 million possible moves in one second. A good chess player can juggle about 100 or 110 moves in his or her head at one moment in time. So it was interesting to note that Kasparov wasn't beaten by a system that somehow copied the way that a human chess player worked. He was beaten by brute force. So the first thing we missed in the 80s was the web. The second was brute force computing. The third was the emergence of the discipline now known as machine learning. And you hear a lot of discussion just now about the power of data, big data, data science, data mining, machine learning. They all related to one another. But what we have come to understand is that as we have available huge amounts of data, and goodness me, the legal profession is more documented and information intensive than most, it turns out that if you have the right software, that data can be analyzed to yield all sorts of interesting insights, patterns, correlations, and we can even make predictions on the basis of large bodies of data. In trying to understand the distinction between the first wave of AI, the rule-based expert systems, and the second wave of AI, the machine learning field, I often find it helpful to think about how it is we learn languages. When I was at school, when I learned French, I first of all learned a list of words, I memorized these, and then I learned the rules of grammar. And in the end, I, I spoke passable French. My friends who spoke far better French were often those who spent their summer in France. And there was no explicit learning of rules of grammar. There was no memorizing of vocabularies. They just absorbed life around them. They heard people speaking, they interacted. And in absorbing all these huge amounts of data, they themselves somehow came to be able to speak the language. And I think that's akin to the distinction between the first generation of computer systems in the world of AI, where we explicitly encode knowledge and expertise, and the second generation where these systems learn from huge amounts of past data. The best example, I think, in the second wave of AI is in the world of game playing. You may have heard of the game of Go, which is played very much in the East. And it's interesting that about a number of years ago, leading AI specialists said it would be a decade before a computer system could play a good game of Go. And then just a couple of years ago, this system called AlphaGo, developed by Google's DeepMind, beat the world Go champion four games to one. 
I want you to think about the second game and the 37th move. The system moved the piece. Expert commentators thought it was a mistake, that move. A World Go champion later described the move as beautiful and said it brought a tear to his eye. No human being had ever thought of that move before. In human beings, we might have called it creative, imaginative, we even might have called it genius, but it was none of these things. It was brute force computing, working on the basis of huge amounts of data underpinned by clever algorithms. And that is what is going to underpin the performance of legal AI systems in the future. That's the second wave of legal AI. And I suppose the best known ones are those that can make predictions. It's interesting in legal practice, for example, systems that can predict what documents an expert would consider to be relevant. So in due diligence in major deals, when junior lawyers and paralegals are often asked to look through huge amounts of documents and identify the worrying or important ones, with a little bit of training, these systems can now outperform these junior lawyers and paralegals in undertaking that task. Similarly, in litigation, where there's very large bodies of documents, these systems can pinpoint relevant documents, often to a higher standard than junior lawyers and paralegals. More controversially, of course, these systems are being used around the world now to predict the outcome of court decisions. This is important not just for lawyers and clients, but it's also important for litigation funders and others for whom the outcome of court decisions is terribly important. It takes me back to Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said the prophecies of what the courts will do in fact and nothing more pretentious are what I mean by the law. Because in reality, prediction is fundamental to daily legal practice, the prediction of the behavior of courts, the prediction of other parties and so forth. And what we're seeing is the emergence of systems that can predict, often outpredict, human beings in helping to anticipate what the future might hold. In all of this though, I think we should be aware of what I call the AI fallacy. And that's the mistaken assumption that the only way that we can develop computer systems that can perform at the standard of human beings or even higher is somehow by copying the way that human beings undertake these tasks. Because often at this stage in my argument, a lawyer or a judge will say, well, I understand what you're saying, Richard, but I think I reason, I'm creative. A machine isn't any of these things and so can't undertake the work I do. And I say that's to commit the AI fallacy because it turns out that not by copying how it is that human beings reason, but by using, again, I say brute force computing, these systems can produce the outputs that human beings can deliver, but in quite different ways. If you think of semi or fully autonomous vehicles, no one is suggesting that the best way to develop a system or a self-driving car is somehow to build a robot that can sit in a normal car and copy the way a human being drives. Quite the contrary, we have developed systems that are purpose-built based on huge amounts of past data about what is effective driving. We develop systems that drive or propel vehicles in ways that are quite unhuman. So the idea is not to copy human beings, it's to develop systems that can produce the outcomes that human beings deliver. My favorite illustration of this is in the world of medicine. I was asked recently to speak to a group of neurosurgeons and to speak about the future. I opened my talk by saying, patients don't want neurosurgeons, gasp in audience. Patients want health. And it is true that for a particular type of health problem, today you are the best answer. But you've asked me here today, I said, to talk about AI and robotics, the future of robots and surgery. But I think you're asking the wrong question. In asking the question, what's the future of surgery, in a sense, you're assuming that surgeons have a future. I don't mean that facetiously. But there's a different question we should be asking. The question is, how in the future will we be solving problems to which human surgeons are currently the best answer? And my guess is in 50 years time, maybe 30 or 20, I have no idea, we'll look back and think it's unbelievable we used to cut heads and bodies open. How primitive. Because the future of healthcare is non-invasive. And so it won't be robotic surgery that will essentially replace traditional surgery. It'll be non-invasive techniques that don't involve surgery at all. And we have to have that mindset, I call it outcome thinking, about the future of legal services and court services. We have to think in a broad-minded way, not how do we simply automate the way that lawyers and judges reason and work today, but instead, how can we create systems that deliver outcomes that society and individuals and businesses want from lawyers and judges even if these outcomes are delivered in fundamentally new ways. And my argument is that AI in a variety of different ways will enable these traditional outcomes to be delivered at a higher standard, a lower cost, or more conveniently.
So all of this leads quite naturally to the question of the impact and potential for AI on the court system and on judges. I have to say, I think that's a question for another day. I also have to recommend to you my book, Online Courts and the Future of Justice, where I try to address this issue at length. To offer some reassurance, we are nowhere near yet in the world of AI to developing systems that can, in a sense, neurophysiologically or neuropsychologically copy what it is that judges do. We're actually nowhere near really to offering systems anywhere like the level that judges operate to generate decisions with reasons, which is fundamentally what judges do. But there are interesting questions arise about systems that can predict the outcome of court decisions more accurately than human lawyers. That's the stage we're at with technology. And I think this raises some fairly fundamental questions for us about how it is we might solve some of the access to justice problems we face today. My own preoccupation in this area is not how we can use AI in any sense to replace the current work of judges, but how we can use AI to help solve the problems of many citizens who today have no realistic access to our court systems.